So uh, before going to balls in the air, uh, the fifth problem set was just due just now. Uh, people asked me wh why I shifted from uh, Wiley Plus to, to Colab. Uh, it's so that I could write the questions. And the questions this go around is, as I believe you noticed, all evidence points is, were harder than the Wiley Plus ones. Um, but that makes you think more. I, I, for all, I, get to, I get to write it myself and get them almost without mistakes. So they're, you know, the first one, I made, I, I, I'm a glass, I made a mistake in it, but I hopefully got my message about th that mistake. Um, the point of this whole exercise is to learn the material and, and, and to, to actually think, also to learn how to think. And so I hope that by giving you these sorts of problems, uh, they, they foster that sort of development, that you really learn how to solve puzzles. Like, like you can figure out how heavy the car is, essentially with a ruler and knowing uh, your own weight. This is kind of uh, crazy. You, you, can, you, can, you can, it is possible to do this. It's not that hard to figure out how to do it. So anyway, I hope this was a useful exercise. The fact that it was harder and that probably uh, the average scores are going to be a little bit less than some of the Wiley Plus based problem sets, it doesn't matter at all averages out in the sense that if all of you shift downward and score as well as the whole cohort goes together, it's not, it, it it's, uh, just shifts my final curve and has no grand effect. Any questions about homework stuff? Uh, the the first, second midterm is on Monday in class. Bring a pencil. What else? Um, I encourage you, as, as always, to take the old exams. Uh, I, I've emailed you how to get access to them if you, at the, at the beginning of the semester, I sent you an email that tells you how to get access to them if you're off grounds. So hopefully you all will remember this. Any questions about the exam? OK. So where things stand. I, I'm, I'm leaving garden watering, going on to balls and air. And in balls and air, we're going to start really using some of the, uh, the tools that I hope that I, you've begun to gather. Uh, Bernoulli's equation. In principle, Bernoulli's equation applies to incompressible fluids, fluids that can't get bigger or smaller like gases can. Um, in practice, as long as the situation isn't too extreme, Bernoulli's equation applies pretty well to air as well. Uh, what's extreme? If the air isn't moving hundreds of miles an hour, you're, you're, you're in pretty good shape with Bernoulli's equation. The point is that, that, that air, you know, just, air has a fourth way to store energy in its compression. And that, that gets uh, complicated. You can compress air, and it stores energy in, its, in the fact that it got smaller. And that uh, makes the life com more complicated. But we can pretty much. Uh, ignore that and just use Bernoulli's equation, which tells us that along streamlines, the energy uh, along a streamline, the energy per drop doesn't change. It's a drop of air now instead of a drop of water. The energy doesn't change in total, but it, it can convert from the various forms to the various other forms. All right, so um, any, any last thoughts on garden watering? I told you about, I introduced viscosity and the effects of viscosity. I introduced uh, the funny pressure changes that occur when you bend the path of a fluid or you squirt it through a nozzle. It, it undergoes these changes in pressure. Uh, and we'll see more of those. And lastly, I, I, I talked about the effects of starting and stopping a flow that you can get things like this water hammer, where if you have a moving column of water and you suddenly stop it, it slams into the thing that stopped it. it and, creates a surge in pressure at its front end, which is the only way in which it knows how to slow to a stop, is to get a pressure imbalance, big pressure in front. And that surge in pressure up in front, when it sort of hits the valves, can break things. Uh, what I forgot, and I went looking for photos of this, um, maybe six or eight years ago, uh, one of the people in the class was a volunteer firefighter and told me about an episode at five points. You know where five points is, where Main Street hits McIntyre Ridge, Water Street, and I forget what else is there. At Five Points, there's a fire station right near there. And they were uh, doing exercises of some sort with the water flow, filling tanks, not filling tanks, uh, opening and closing the fire hydrants, basically. They opened the fire hydrant at one point, and then they closed the fire hydrant suddenly, 
Remember I told you that, that they've got a big column of water? I told you these, uh, these may be apocryphal stories about breaking water mains in, in, uh, in dor with dormitories. They broke the water main at five points by, by abruptly closing the fire hydrant. The pressure surged upward as the water slammed into the fire hydrant's valve and blew out a very old water main. And so he, he sent me a picture, which I can't find, of a basically 15 feet of water main that was just the whole side was blown out of it by that surge in pressure. So it's real. It really does happen. You really do blow out water mains with this. I just had forgotten. All right? Any questions about why that happened? You know, it, it, OK. Balls in air. So I'll start off with a question. And this question is, is it's, this is a challenging one. And it's, it's even, it will be challenging when I explain how it works. But if you have a gentle river flowing by, a gentle river, think laminar flow. So laminar flow in the river goes by a cylindrical post. So you're, you're standing on a bridge maybe looking down at the post below you that's supporting the bridge. And the water goes around the post at the sides of the post, where the water is sort of ha has made it halfway around, it's arcing around the post. It hasn't gotten to the back yet. At the sides of the post, the water level doesn't necessarily have to be even with the rest of the, of the river. Is it higher than the rest of the river, equal, or lower? Uh, higher, lower, or equal is how I've got the ordering. Let's see what, can, do you, you okay with the question? How many think that the water level on the edges, of, on the sides, basically, of that post are higher than average? How many think that it's lower than average? And how many think it's average? See, the majority are going for higher. And I'll tell you that the answer is actually lower. If you look down in that situation and watch, you'll see the water be, be higher. It actually, be, the water level will be higher at the front of the post, where the water essentially collides with the post and slows down. And when it slows down, it's turning kinetic energy into other forms. <gasps> turns it into gravitational in effect and rises. And, and pressure too, but, 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 but the surface is ultimately, uh, pressure stays atmospheric and it, and it goes up in height. On the sides where the water arcs around the post, it actually speeds up. It creates an effect of nozzle for itself. And we'll see this when we look at the flow of air around a ball. So that the flow around the sides of that post, that water is actually not, not, it's not slowing down. It's not staying at constant velocity. It's actually going faster. It's squirting around the sides of the post. And because it's now converted, it, it's losing, what? No, it's gaining kinetic energy. That energy's got to come from somewhere. So it has to come from gravitational potential energy. It's right there at the surface, so it, its pressure is the same. The pressure is atmospheric. But right there at the surface, it actually descends. And this is visible on posts. It's visible on ships. Uh, a ship moving through water. There's, there, at the bow of the ship, the water rises up. But on the sides of the ship, it actually, it actually drops lower. So if you can think back to your sort of memories of speedboats going by and stuff like that, you think, wow, the water level is funny around the boat. At the back of the boat, it's a big mess. It's churning white water, and that's another part of the story. But on the front and the sides, interesting changes in the level of the water. Is that OK? Or questions about that? So next time you watch water flowing around things, watch, you know, take a look at the level. Uh, We'll see more of the, that, that story. If it didn't make any sense when I just said it to you, you'll see it again. It's OK. Um, so things like with balls in air. Uh, now, bring, bring air in. Way back when I talked about falling balls, I neglected all the air effects. I neglected buoyancy, which we've already dealt with it at some length with balloons. Uh, but there's also, we neglected air resistance effects. And so now we're going to start to deal with the air resistance effects that come from a ball moving through air, interacts with the air and loses some of its forward momentum. So it's pushed backwards. So that's one. The other thing is that the balls, uh, cleverly thrown, can actually go sideways. To, uh, so I say accelerate sideways. They can curve. And they do that by pushing the, by deflecting the airstream. So uh, spinning balls, they have to spin to do this. Um, but they can deflect the airstream with the help of their spin. And they can curve in flight. And that is not an air resistance effect. That's something else. It's actually known as lift. And we'll get to that pretty soon. OK, so this is just a little preview. So OK, start off with my, my questions. And the first question is, is, why do balls experience air resistance? And this is a, just a general theme, is 
is what the heck is air resistance? Uh, it's true not just of air, of course, it's water as well. So if you're a swimmer, you know that you're fighting something. What, what's, the, what's the water resistance? Uh, so I'll do one of my questions. I've gotten lazy about asking these things, but I'll ask this one. If air resistance slows a ball down, that means the ball goes from moving fast to moving slow, its, it's momentum decreased. Right? If it was moving 100 miles an hour when you threw it, you know, after you get a contract with the Major League Baseball, it was 100 miles an hour when you threw it. By the time it crosses the plate, it's only going 90 miles an hour. Well, it lost momentum toward the, toward the home plate. It has less na at, as it crosses it. Where'd the momentum go? You get the question? How many think it was given to the entire Earth? No. How many think that it was given to the air near the ball? Okay. How many think that it becomes potential momentum? There is no such thing as potential momentum. Good. Uh, how many think that it becomes thermal momentum? There's no such thing as thermal momentum. Good. It is B. It's given to the air near the ball. The ball transfers forward momentum, momentum, say, towards home plate, to the air. The air now has momentum towards home plate. It's moving to some extent with the ball. The ball is, in effect, dragging it with, the ball is dragging the air with the ball. And uh, the official, the formal name the, for air resistance is drag, because it involves dragging the fluid, dragging the air. So the, the origins of air resistance are the interaction between the ball and the air and the transfer of momentum from one to the other. The, the, the two, it, it, it resembles friction in the sense that the dra drag forces, the air exerts a drag force on the ball, the ball exerts a drag force on the air. These are Newton's third law pair. They're therefore equal and opposite. They come about because, in a you know, simple-minded way of saying it, is that, that, that these drag forces act to try to bring the two to the same velocity. The air and the ball, given, you know, if they're moving relative to one another, drag forces show up and fight that, that relative motion. They try to get rid of it. So if, if a ball is moving through air, the air tries to stop the, the ball, and the ball tries to speed up the air. They, anyway, all right? Uh, so those are known as drag, th that's known as drag force. It turns out there are a couple of types of drag force, and we'll, and we'll see those in a minute. Um, the other thing that can happen with a ball, if the ball is spinning, is that it gets pushed to the side. So this is a situation, let, let me move with the ball. So, I'll, so, I'll, so we'll have stationary air. The ball is moving through the air. I'm, I'm watching the ball. It is not moving as far as I am concerned. Uh, from your perspective, the ball is. So, so we can look at it from different frames of reference. The point is this, that if you move with me, okay, so let's, move, let's all visualize ourselves as moving with us. The air is now going by. In that case, a spinning ball does something tricky. It, instead of just transferring momentum to the passing air and dragging the air with it, it deflects the air to the side. Maybe, toward, maybe this way, maybe that way, maybe up, maybe down. The, the, the stream of air gets pushed to the side. For that to happen, the ball had to push the air. Air doesn't deflect for free. It, it, a deflection, a turn, is an acceleration. So you have to push on the air to make it def deflect. You have to push it to the side. So the ball, in effect, pushes the air to the side, and the air pushes back. And it shoves the ball opposite the direction of the deflection. Well, those forces, where the ball ends up being pushed at right angles to the ball's movement for the air, or the air's movement for past the ball, and the ball's pushed right angles, that's called a lift force, just to give it a name. It's distinct from drag forces. Drag forces are always downstream or downwind. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, I, I can't help it, but, but in the early days of cell phones, when, those, when, the, when that sort of thing would happen, um, the, solu the solution was to have people whose phones went off do a song of my, cho my choosing, <laughs> which was typically Itsy Bitsy Spider or uh, I'm a Little Teacup 
with hand gestures. So I'm a little teapot short. And that mostly stopped the problem. But then I would get exhibitionists who would get, they may have rigged, arranged for a phone call so they could have their opportunity, their, their moment in the sun. Anyway, I stopped doing it. All right, I won't do it. Uh, but it was, yeah. So drag forces are always downwind in effect. So, so if, we're, if, we're the, if we're with the ball, so life is simple, and the, and the air is moving past us, the ball is always pushed downwind by, by drag forces, never upwind. And this is, just comes about because the, the two are trying to bring each other to the same velocity, not opposite. They're not trying to get more different. They're trying to get more same. So it's always downwind. Same for water, it's downstream. You go out in the middle of the water in a, in a stream, you get pushed downstream, not upstream. I mean, you wish, but no. Lift forces are always at right angles to the flow. So they are the other possibility that, that, that makes any sense. Drag is downstream. Lift forces are always at right angles to the flow. So if we're, here, if we're with the ball and the air is going by us, the lift forces are, can be up, which is the obvious thing associated with lift, but not necessarily up. There can be lift forces toward you, toward me, downward, anything along this, this plane, this surface here. Those are all lift forces. OK. Um, you OK with the idea what a lift force is, what a drag force is? Two possibilities. There's no upstream force. They don't exist. Uh, what about these? The, the, both of these types of forces are collectively known as aerodynamic forces. Assuming it's air, if it's water, then they're hydrodynamic forces. But who cares? It's just naming things. Uh, there are three types of drag that are of some importance. There is one known as viscous drag. So these are the last lines on the slide. Viscous drag is the drag associated with with the rubbing effect that comes with a fluid that has viscosity, the layers of fluid interact with each other, and the innermost layer, the one touching the surface, is stationary on that surface. So moving fluids moving past an object ultimately convey, uh, they rub in effect by, by way of viscous forces, and they convey momentum. So there's drag associated with just that, that rubbing effect. OK? That's viscous drag. There's a second type of, kind of, type of drag which off, is, is more important in your everyday life, actually, than viscous drag. It's known as pressure drag. And where pressure drag comes about, as we will see, is that the flow around of something like a baseball is not perfect, simple laminar flow that's, that only involves that rubbing. It has turbulence in it. And the turbulence gives rise to a second kind of drag known as pressure drag. We'll see how. In the, in, the, in the presence of turbulence, pressures around the ball become uh, unbalanced, and the ball gets pushed downstream. The third type of uh, drag, which I'll give pretty short shrift to, it won't show up until we talk about airplanes, is known as induced drag. It's, it's a drag force that is a push down wind that comes from the act of trying to obtain lift. When an airplane, for example, obtains lift from a passing airstream. And that lift is what holds the airplane in the air. So an airplane needs lift 100. You know, that's, that's the whole story for an airplane. The act of obtaining that upward lift for an airplane uh, necessarily slows the airstream down somewhat and transfers momentum to the airstream relative to the plane. That's known as induced lift. It comes from the act of, of obtaining lift. Uh, it's, it's called induced drag. Okay. All right. So four aerodynamic forces: uh, the lift and the three kinds of drag. Naming them is not important. Understanding why they happen is 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 worth is is, is the point. Okay. So how does air flow around a ball? And the answer to that is well, it depends, and it depends particularly on Reynolds number. Remember Reynolds number? I, I brought it up last time for the following purpose, to, to, to give us some sense of whether a flow around an obstacle is going to be viscous, viscous dominated and therefore laminar, or inertial dominated and therefore turbulent. So Reynolds number was this pure number that when it's small indicates the viscosity, the ordering 
effective viscosity wins. And you get smooth laminar flow. Pieces of fluid stay adjacent to, to their buddies. Uh, the, na the neighborhood stays together. Uh, at high Reynolds number, inertia wins. Inertia dominates. And the neighborhood of, of, of portions of fluid gets ripped apart and thrown every which way. You get turbulence. And there's some transitional regime, which is interesting, but for the experts. OK? So at low Reynolds number, which is to say when viscosity dominates and the world is laminar, the flow is laminar, you get viscous drag, but no pressure drag. The flow stays orderly around objects, and all you got is viscous drag. Uh, at high Reynolds number, uh, inertia is dominating. Patches of fluid get torn apart limb from limb, and you end up with turbulence. And now unbalanced pressures start showing up in the story, and you get a second kind of drag in addition to viscous drag. The second type of drag shows up, and that's pressure drag. And it's for, for objects moving through air, it's the dominant effect. So that's, you know, we need to see both, but uh, pressure drag is going to turn out to be more important. All right. So I'm going to work us slowly from low Reynolds number to high Reynolds number, which sounds like a crazy thing. And what the heck is that? It means that we're, we'll start with visc visc uh, viscous effects dominant and work our way to inertial effects dominant. Viscous effects, for viscous effects to be dominant in air, well, air doesn't have much viscosity. That's a problem. So viscosity already has both of its arms and one of its legs tied behind it, it its back, uh, if it's going to try to win this. Because the air's got almost no viscosity. Uh, what else is important? Well, we got we to gotta squelch all the inertial effects. How do you, how do, you do that? Go very slow. Uh, air's got a, a fixed density, so we can't play with that. But you've got to go very slow and use very small obstacles to impede the flow. It, you, the, the idea of the, 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 the Reynolds number, the bigger the obstacle you present to the passing fluid, the more of a struggle it is for viscosity to try to keep all the patches of fluid organized so they go around this obstacle and come back together smoothly. So bigger obstacles uh, favor inertia's uh, attempt at taking over and turbulence as a result. So in order to, to allow viscosity in air to, to win, we have to work with very little obstacles and very slow movement of those, those obstacles. What's an example of this? Well, we go to the smallest particles. I, you know, they're easily available here. Is this going to go? Or did it turn itself off? Ratso, it's off. No, it's on. Well, then go. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll look down to it. <laughs> There's a second possibility. Old school. See this stuff? <laughs> right. It's chalk. But this is chalk, too. If I take a piece of chalk like this and let go of it, we have more than one piece of chalk. Um, chalk is dense, heavy stuff. Buoyant forces are not going to support its weight. It's too heavy and dense for that. It falls. But, but th th this cloud now, which is gradually dissipating, um, hangs in the air. Those little particles are chalk, same as the big piece of chalk. And yet they don't fall the same way. You know, why not? They're being held up by drag forces. As they try to fall, they begin to move downward through ultimately relatively stationary air from the perspective of a little tiny particle of, uh, of chalk, there's a breeze coming up at it, blowing around it, and rubbing against its surfaces. It's experiencing viscous drag, that rubbing effect. Uh, the flow around the piece, that tiny particle is laminar the whole way around, and all that's happening is that rubbing effect is keeping the chalk, chalk from falling very fast. It hits what I talked, I talked way back when about terminal velocity. That as, as the particle 
moves faster and faster. It's, it's being pulled down by its weight. It's trying to go faster and faster. And as it does, the breeze coming up at it is, is becoming effectively faster and faster. And there comes a point when that upward breeze, which exerts an upward viscous drag force on the particle, exerts an, up, an upward force that equals the weight of the particle. And it no longer accelerates. It goes down at constant velocity. And the constant velocity for these itty, 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 bitty particles is on the order of a few millimeters a second. It's so slow that they seem to just hang there. You have to make the air in the room very still. And then they gradually settle. And that's why when you close the door on a room and just leave it with no airflow in it, all the dust in the room gradually settles on the top surfaces of everything. OK? Um, a little bit about. I mean, that's, the, that's sort of the vague, big picture version of it. Let's look at what happens around, instead of a piece of chalk, a tiny piece of chalk, let's look at, let's look at a baseball. If the baseball were moving so slowly that air's viscosity were able to keep the flow of air around that ball perfect in laminar the whole way. It's, it's hypothetical. You can't move the ball that slow. But you know, it would be moving like as fast as your fingernails grow. But here's the idea. This is a picture of a baseball. Uh, we're going to be moving with the baseball. And the baseball, you might think of it as heading to the left, but since we're moving with it, we see the breeze coming at us. So the, so the air is, is, is coming from the left, passing the baseball, heading to the right. Is that OK? It's a rightward moving stream. That's the, what the arrows are doing here. And that rightward moving stream of air comes along and bumps into the baseball. And when it does, the flow bends around the ball, and those, that's visible in the streamlines. So here are the streamlines, these guys. These are the paths that, are, that individual sort of drops of air will follow. And the colors, again, represent pressure. With the purple, the violet end of the spectrum, of the rainbow spectrum, being high pressure, and the red portion of the rainbow spectrum being low pressure. The pressure goes high where the, ball, where the air hits the front of the baseball. Oddly, the pressure goes low where it bends around the sides of the baseball. And the pressure, even more oddly, goes high again at the back of the baseball as it leaves. So before I explain why this happens, you OK with the idea that the streamlines go around it? Furthermore, the pressure at the surface of the baseball isn't atmospheric pressure in most places. It's actually a little higher or a little lower. It's a real change. If you put a little meter on there, you would measure a higher and lower pressures at those points. If you were a little bug sitting on the ball, you'd notice this. Um, anything else? Okay, let, me, let me explain why this is happening. When the air encounters that ball, uh, there, in principle, there's a streamline right dead center that, that comes to a dead stop on the front surface of the ball. It's kind of a, it's, it's a, it, it's a hypothetical point. No, there's, there's, it's got no width, so it, there's, it's, just a, it's more than just a marker. The air above this line arcs away from the ball surface to go around it. The, the air streams below arc the other way. So it's sort of divi th this is the dividing line more than anything else. Well. For, the air for these air streams that are coming along to bend, they need to be pushed. Things, in, you know, inertia is inertia. An, a streamline doesn't bend unless something pushes it. And the only thing that will push a streamline in the open air is a difference in pressure. So if a streamline that was just minding its own business going exactly to the left suddenly bends towards you all, that came about because there was an imbalance of pressure in the vicinity of that streamline. And it bends toward low pressure, because that's the direction of the, of the overall push. High pressure on one side, low pressure on the other. The high pressure pushes toward the low pressure and wins. So if, I, if I'm a streamline and I bend toward you, it's because I had high pressure on my right, low pressure on my left. Is that OK? So for this streamline up here above the midline, for that streamline to bend up as we view it, it had to have high pressure on its right and low pressure on its left. This has to be higher pressure than that. High pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. Well, that means all these streamlines are bending toward their left. 
that means that this is higher pressure than out here. Well, way out here, far enough away, the air doesn't even know the ball is there. That's atmospheric pressure. Way out here is atmospheric pressure. It's all, it's all atmospheric pressure in the, in the great outdoors. So for this, these streamlines to bend away from the ball here, at the top front of the ball, that must be, the higher, that must be higher than atmospheric pressure. It's pushing the streamlines away. Questions about that idea? The pressure at the front of the ball goes high. Uh, this actually looks a lot like a diffuser where the streamlines get spread out because it's basically, a, it's effectively like a diffuser. It's like this, a stream of air hits a wall, spreads out, and it, right at the dead, near the center of that, that impact where it collides with the wall, the pressure goes high. It's converting its kinetic energy into pressure potential energy. So that's what you get. You got high pressure here for you know, a thousand ways of thinking about it. High pressure at the front of the ball. It's real, it's pushing the ball backwards. By itself, that's a problem for the ball trying to make headway. Okay, the stream, the, the air then bends uh, around the side of the ball. It can't break away from the ball for reasons that are complicated. Uh, it, does, it does follow the surface of the ball. It doesn't leave a hole behind it. It would leave a vacuum, and that's, that's part of the problem. So it has to keep bending. It bends, in this case, toward, the streamlines are bending toward the ball. They're, they're, if I'm a streamline, here's the ball. They're bending this way. They're evidently being pushed toward the ball's surface. Is that okay? They're bending toward the surface? Well, again, streamlines bend because of pressure imbalances. So if they're bending toward the surface, they must be pushed toward the surface by higher pressure far from the surface. So the pressure of the, uh, for each of these streamlines, all of them are bending toward the ball, they have higher pressure on their left than on their right. So they're pushed overall toward their right, and they bend toward their right. OK? So since way out here is atmospheric pressure, and that is higher than the pressures closer to the ball, the pressure close to the ball is less than atmospheric pressure. There's a partial vacuum there on the sides of the ball. In the middle of a baseball game, there's a low pressure region on the side, all the sides of the ball. I mean, this is a two-dimensional picture, but it goes all the way around the sort of the, the, the waist of the ball. Low pressure, less than atmospheric pressure. Um, you can see that in the, in the redness of the drawing. I, so I marked the low pressure with red. The other thing you see is the streamlines get close together because that air, in addition to going to low pressure, is sort of squirting through there at high speed. It has converted pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. It is a high speed portion of airflow there, higher than atmosphere, uh, higher than the speed of the ball through the air, high speed. Okay, so the air in the front of the ball was moving slowly and at high pressure. The air on the sides of the ball is moving fast and at low pressure. And now it's time to go to the back of the ball. Well, the air continues to arc around with the, the ball for a while, and then it, it can't just pile up here behind the ball because that would ruin steady state flow. You can't accumulate anything. You would then be able to see the passage of time as the, as the air piles up. So the air's got to leave. It has to, to go away from the ball. For that to happen, it has to bend once more away from the ball to leave, be left behind. And for, it, for the air to bend away from the ball like this, it has to be pushed outward again. So once again, it accelerates from high pressure to low pressure. So this must be higher pressure than, than this. Well, way out, way out in the distance is atmosphere. So this must be above atmospheric pressure. And that's the purple, the violet end of the spectrum. And also, the, the widely spaced streamlines tell you that the air has slowed down. It's spread out. And so this is slow-moving, high-pressure air here. So the grand observation is, when you get laminar flow around a, a, a baseball or basically any object moving through air or having air move past it or some combination of the two, you get high pressure at front where the air collides with the ball. You get low pressure on all the sides where the air is arcing around at high speed trying to stay with the ball surface. And you get high pressure behind the ball where the air is finally bending to head off into the distance and leave the ball behind. All right? So high pressure, high pressure, low pressure, low pressure. It all balances. If you go to any point on the baseball and look on the, op the diametrically opposite point, 
the pressure is the same. So high pressure in front, high pressure in back. High pressure inside, high pressure inside. Every which, they all cancel. And the result is the pressure effects on the ball are zero. There's no overall pressure based force on the ball. So the perfect cancellation. It's the same way as there's no overall pressure effect on this sheet of paper. High pressure, high pressure, but they cancel. So there's no pressure related forces. The only force this ball experiences are the rubbing effects of having the air go by. And that's viscous drag. Okay? So for a object moving through air or having air move past it, very slowly, particularly for very, 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 very small objects where the flow is laminar, you get viscous drag, this beautiful cancellation of pressures. This, this is real. This is, this, this is th those chalk particles had this kind of flow around them. And they were experiencing viscous drag for these tiny particles that have almost no volume and therefore almost no weight. Uh, they, they're actually able to be suspended by that viscous drag forces. This is what keeps in cold season, which I guess we're heading into, you know, that kind of stuff, flu and cold. The, you know what keeps the stuff suspended in the air after your sneeze? It's viscous drag forces. All that stuff is trying to fall, but as it begins to descend through the air, it, it experiences upward, as it goes downward through the air, it experiences upward viscous drag forces that slow its descent and, and, and give it a terminal velocity that's tiny. And if the air is still, that is motionless, these things are coming down at a millimeter per second or something, you know, some pitifully slow speed. If the air has actually got an updraft or somebody's walked through the room and the air is swirling around, the, the tiny particles uh, will, can get lifted by the rising air so they can get, get suspended. They actually can go up. You've seen this with, if you've watched dust in, the, in sunlight, you've watched, you can see the air currents in the room as the dust gets whisked around with the, with the moving air. It's trying to fall, but it, it, it's experiencing viscous drag forces that just make it, it make its, its descent difficult. All right? Any questions about viscous drag? About the, the pressure fluctuations, the wacky pressure fluctuations around a tiny, uh, around an object that's, that's experiencing this lander flow? Okay. So, having told you about this, there are limited circumstances in which this is the, the flow around a particle. Baseballs just isn't going to happen because the baseball moves too fast through the air and consequently doesn't, uh, doesn't experience just viscous drag. This, if you remember, eh, this is a, let me do this. This, this is the same question I asked you earlier. Now we've got a little bit of a, a, a reason to understand this. When the fluid in a lazy river encounters that post and, and does funny things, it's very similar to the flow around a, a ball where the, when the flow is, is laminar. At the front of the ball, the fluid slows down. And it's giving up kinetic energy. What form does that energy go into? Well, it, in the ball, it, it goes into pressure, uh, potential energy. Uh, at the surface of the water, it goes into gravitational potential energy because the pressure is stuck by virtue of being in contact with the open air. So the, 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 fl the fluid rises where the, where the, where the, the river cr crashes into the post. The, the, the river level drops on the sides of the post where it is arcing around the post. It is speeding up. It's traveling faster, therefore. It has more of its energy tied up as kinetic energy. It has to give up one of the other forms. It gives up gravitational, and, just, and it's lower on the sides. The water then returns to the back, slows down again. Its kinetic energy de decreases, so its height increases. It actually rises up there in the back, assuming it stays laminar. If it fails to stay laminar, life is complicated in the back of that post. But uh, if it does stay laminar, there will actually be a rebound. The water actually will rise back up above ambient river level before leaving the post behind. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Well, OK, so this is this question. Um, just just uh, anticipating what happens if you move faster than a, a, a snail's pace through air. Well, car, 
Most cars go faster than a snail's pace, although I sometimes when I'm impatient, I, I think otherwise. And when they go blasting down a road and they pass over some leaves or near some leaves, <laughs> um, these leaves are all swirling around. What kind of flow is present there? Is it laminar? Is it turbulent? How many think it's laminar? How many think it's turbulent? Yay! Right, it's turbulent flow. And you're seeing it just simply uh, illustrated or, or, or just displayed by virtue of the moving leaves, which are being swept along by drag forces, incidentally. Uh, okay. So the onset of turbulence, the, if, if you go back to the flow around a ball, this is, this is a, a, a wordy slide about the following observation. And actually, I'm going to I'll leave that up there. But, but if you remember with, with, the, with the flow, the beautiful laminar flow around a ball that I had drawn up here before, the flow had high pressure. You know, it was high pressure where the, where the air encountered the ball for the first time. Low pressure on the sides, and then high pressure on the back. Remember that story? Well, that means that the air that was flowing around the sides of the ball, which is going fast, but it has low pressure, has to continue on and soon become high pressure, slow moving air. The air has to trade its kinetic energy for pressure potential energy as it goes around the back of the ball. And it's, that means that it's burrowing forward into rising pressure. The pressure in front of it is higher than the pressure behind it as it moves, moves along. It's using its momentum to move opposite a pressure gradient, what's known as an adverse pressure gradient. The pressure gradient is, is pushing the, those portions of air backwards, slowing them down, forcing them to convert kinetic energy into pressure potential energy. For that flow from, from side to back to make its way all the way around that back of the ball, I, I, you, you've seen this for a while. If you want, I, I'll come back to it, but I just want to just make sure you, you, you know what I'm talking about here. This. We're talking about the flow from here on the sides where the air is moving fast, but its pressure is low to this flow on the back of the ball where the pressure is high and the speed is low. The air in these streamlines right here, they are flowing from, high, from low pressure to high pressure. They're being pushed backward the whole way. You OK with the fact that they're pushed backward? It's, that's higher pressure. I'm, I'm heading to high pressure. That's low pressure. I'm being pushed backward, OK? That works out OK as long as those streamlines keep all their momentum and energy, ordered energy. They have to keep heading forward because they got to get to the back, and then they can leave. If they don't make it to the back, suppose air one of these streamlines, something came in, comes in there and steals some of its momentum and energy. It doesn't have enough energy and momentum to make it to the back into this high pressure, even if it converts all of its remaining kinetic energy into pressure potential energy, it, it, it's short. I mean, a dollar short, ah, I can't make it. That causes a disaster. So I'll go back to this, to this view graph for those of you want. Uh, that initiates turbulence. What happens is the flow that was going around the side of the ball, trying to get to the back of the, of, of the ball, if it loses ordered energy in particular, I'll leave momentum aside. If it loses ordered energy, it can't make it to the back of the ball. It's, it's just short. It comes to a stop. When it comes to a stop, this is not steady state flow anymore. The, the story changes. There no, the streamlines vanish, and a pocket of air develops back behind the ball, accumulated air that then peels the flow away from the back of the ball. And what, what's left then is flow around the ball with an air pocket, a turbulent air pocket, or also known as a turbulent wake, like, like a, the wake of a boat behind the ball. So uh, I'll show you the picture of this. Here's the, the air in this, going around the side of the ball, tried to make it to the back of the ball. If it, if it runs out of energy, it doesn't make it to the back of the ball. It piles up. It, it, then the X is a wedge that peels the whole flow away from the back of the ball. So instead of getting this nice, smooth laminar flow and the, uh, the high pressure region, at the back of the ball, you get a big, messy, turbulent wake, which is basically the atmospheric pressure. Nothing special anymore. Um, so this is the flow around a ball 
when you get turbulence in the back. And the turbulence is triggered by the failure of the airflow to, to go to the back. Well, why wouldn't the airflow make it to the back? It, had, it, it, it should have had enough energy to get the job done. It, according to Bernoulli's uh, ideas, the energy of, along a streamline should be constant. So you have high pressure, uh, low speed air here. This, is, this has lots of pressure potential energy. Then it's got lots of, of kinetic energy. It should be able to go back to lots of pressure potential energy. Life should be good, except that neglects viscosity and the effects of viscosity and the effects of rubbing on the back surface of the ball. The airflow along the back here, trying to get to the back of the ball, rubs against the ball and wastes some of its lovely, precious, necessary ordered energy. Just burns it up, you know, turns it into thermal energy. It, 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 it comes up short as a result of rubbing. So the, 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 it's first the, it's the streamline that's closest to the ball that, that, that runs into trouble first. It's the one that, run, that rubs the most, and it just runs out of ordered energy. It doesn't make it to the back of the ball, and it starts the peeling operation and leaves this big air pocket behind the ball. So this is the flow around a baseball that has been pitched towards home plate or thrown at any, any speed that a, that, a, that, a, that a normal person can throw at. All those possible speeds, from, from as slow as you can throw it, because you can't throw it slow enough to be viscous, to experience only viscous drag, to as fast as you can throw it, they're all going to end up with these turbulent wakes like this behind them. What are the consequences of that? The ball effectively pulls a cylinder of air behind it. It's, as it. As it flies towards home plate, where's my baseball? So it flies, you know, flies towards home plate. It's being followed by a cylinder of air that, that it keeps getting more and dragging more with it. So it's, it's, it's basically drilling a hole through the, the air it's, it's passing through and carrying the, 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 the remnants of that drilling process with it. And that moving air is, is carrying momentum that used to be in the ball. So the ball is losing momentum to this air. Uh, a consequence of that is that the faster it moves through the air, first off, the more air it encounters every second, and the faster that air that it encounters is dragged. So if you double its speed, it hits twice as much air every second, and it gives twice as much momentum to every portion of air, every kilogram of air, because it drags that air twice as fast. So doubling the speed of the ball quadruples the drag force. The faster you go, the, fa the bigger the drag force gets, and it goes up fast, because it goes up as the square of your speed. Uh, so this is why uh, you know, walking, you don't feel very much pressure. It's pr you're experiencing pressure drag when you're walking. Uh, it's not too bad. But if you start running, or if you start sprinting, it becomes bad in a hurry. Because double your speed, you fe feel four times as much air resistance. You're getting twice as much air, and you're dragging it twice as fast. Okay, so drag matters a lot. It matters even, you know, it, it's particularly in water. Oh, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, I can go on forever. I'll stop with that. Um, I'm not. For the, let me let me just finish up with the class. Uh, one more observation before I leave this, and that is, you know, is there anything you can do? Ah, that 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 peeling away process, leaving a giant wake, is just terrible. Is there a solution to it? Well. There is a solution, and that is to make the ball go even faster, which seems counterintuitive. If the ball goes fast enough, so I have a picture of what, the, what I want to show you. If the ball goes fast enough through the air, something, something bizarre happens, and that is that these streamlines of air that are drawn in here uh, as nice and separate, those streamlines. The, the innermost streamlines, the, the ones that rub against the ball and, and, and uh, are at risk of losing their energy, their ordered energy, and coming to a stop, they begin to tumble. They undergo a transition to, to, a, to a local turbulence. It's not turbulence in the main flow. It's turbulence in the air that's closest to the ball, that is most aware of the ball surface. It's a region of, of, of the airflow known as the boundary layer, which kind of has a nice ring to it. It's the, it's the portion of air that really is paying attention to the ball surface. And up until now, the flow in that boundary layer 
has itself been laminar up until the disaster occurs. And that means the innermost layer in the boundary layer, the one closest, closest, closest to the surface, does all the rubbing and experiences all of the energy loss and is, is not helped by its buddies. It's, it, make, it has to fight the whole way all by itself, and it runs out of energy early and causes a disaster. But if you get that boundary layer itself to play tag team, make it tumble so that the, those, those innermost group of, of layers trade places, local turbulence, Bound, turbulence in the boundary layer, they, they spell each other, they take turns, and one of them fights and loses energy, and then it swaps out, and another one comes in, fights and loses energy. They work better. They make it farther toward the back of the ball before, as a, as a team, they finally just give up and come to a stop and create a turbulent wake. And the result is you get a turbulent wake behind the ball, but it's smaller. You're dragging a smaller column of air behind the ball. This occurs for a baseball a little over 100 miles an hour. When you go fast enough, you get a turbulent boundary layer that shrinks the size of the wake. Uh, more about that uh, next time, but I want to just point out that the reason a golf ball has dimples is in a deliberate <coughs> attempt to trip the boundary layer and make it tumble. So that this, a, ba a dimpled ball has a, creates a smaller wake because it has this tag team uh, behavior. And so without dimples, the, base, the uh, golf ball won't travel nearly as far as with dimples because of this boundary layer effect. All right, I'll, I'll treat it properly on Friday. <laughs>